Ben Marshall. I'm Radio Parts resident geek and uh, product expert, officially on my business card, which is always fun. Apparently I'm the only one on LinkedIn that's called that anywhere in the world, which is uh, always good fun. I'm here today to talk about CCTV and all its variations, and I'm going to try and compress it as much as I can f to fit the time. A large focus of what I'm going to be doing today is about the actual setup of our DOS NVRs and DVRs, because that's where I find a lot of the questions come from. Plugging in a camera, most of you can do that. Right cabling, right equipment, plug it all in. It's then what happens next to it. How do you get that working on somebody's phone? How do you get that recording you know, only on motion, line crossing, other smart features and things like that for it? So that's what I'm going to do a fair detail on today. Um, I will probably be glossing over lots and lots and lots of it and there'll be a lot more detail than I can possibly ever cover. I plan to run some separate training sessions over the next couple of months here, some within hours, some out of hours to try and cover everything. And I'll have multiple of these systems set up. We'll have cameras up and going so that you guys can get a hands-on chance to actually play with it and work out what's happening with it too. Um, it's something we've been, you know, I've been promising for a couple of years now and it's been hard to try and find the time. Well, my plan is this year I will find that time and make sure it happens. So it um, gives you a good chance to get a feel for what's going on. Um, two things I want to start off with though. Number one, here in Victoria and in most states in Australia, to install a CCTV system in somebody's home other than your own, you need a security license to do that job. So if you're an electrician doing these as part of what you're doing, it's absolutely fine, but you still have to go through the process to apply for and get a security license. It's pretty easy to do. Victoria Police make it quite simple here for Victoria, but there are restrictions in terms of if you go across a state border, like if you go up to Kyabram and then go across the other side of the river, you know, Barham or Kundruk on the other side, well, Barham's this side, Kundruk the other side, you need a different license or you need a, I think it's a traveling license or a temporary license to be able to install a system in New South Wales, even though it's, you know, 10 meters the other side of the Murray. So just keep that in mind when you're doing these sort of jobs that are out there. It's part of an idea to make sure that the person that comes into your home to do this kind of work isn't you know, an ex-criminal, hasn't got a brother who's, you know, uh, a thief, a professional thief, because you're showing him through a house and going, here's my valuable safe, here's my Monet up on the wall, here's where we keep all our valuables, and, uh, oh, by the way, who are you, and what do you do, and what background do you have? Yeah, the security license takes all of that stuff away and takes care of it for you. So, background check with the police, fingerprint check, and pay a license fee per year, per three years, something like that as well, so... Uh, definitely worth keeping in mind. One other thing is that on our website we have uh, some installer lists and included in that are people who are good on the CCTV side of things. So if you want to be included in that, if that's something that you want to add to your business or you want the extra referrals that we can give you, let us know. We'll be happy to talk to you about it and see what we can do to you know, get some more work your way as well. We love having people out there promoting our products and promoting the right way to do things. So the more that we can do that way, the better. All right, so I wanted to start with probably the most ubiquitous type of cameras on the market today, which are the retail friendly ones. So TP-Link we sell, the Casa cams is their current range of little miniature cameras. They have the Casa Spot, there's a KC200, indoor, outdoor, PTZ cameras and a lot more. These are all Wi-Fi based. Some might have an ethernet port, but the rest of it's just, you know, take it home, plug it in, set it up with the app on your phone, and you're up and running. Um, simple enough, and that's a very common way to do CCTV these, way, these days. Ring video doorbells and the Ring outdoor camera systems and the rest are all based around the same sort of idea. Make sure your Wi-Fi or Ethernet's in the right spot and you get a signal. Obviously, Wi-Fi is a drawback of these things. If you're trying to push you know, four, eight cameras around, that's a lot of data you're trying to push onto your Wi-Fi, and your streaming might suffer. So. Guess what, TP-Link sells a great range of Wi-Fi access points, modems, routers, mesh units, and the rest. You know, there's probably a reason why they're getting into the camera game and the Wi-Fi game altogether. The other issue I have with these ones in a general sense is recording time. Now, with the free, I think, Casa Care system that they run, Casa Care is, let's have a look here. Casa Care, the cloud clip is limited to two days or one gigabyte worth of total data for Casa Cam and Casa Cam Outdoor and 12 hours or 256 megabytes for the Casa Spot Cam. So if you buy one of these little ones, put that in, 
you've got 256 megabytes worth of data that this is going to store, or about 12 hours worth. So if you're at work for eight hours a day and you never go away, that's probably a pretty decent little system for you. You're going to see something when it happens, you're going to know what's happened then, record it off to your phone or do something else like that with it and off you go. With the other ones, potentially you could go away for a couple of weeks and you've only got two days worth of recording here if something happens and if the motion's detected and triggered and whatever else happens for it. So there's a limitation quite, you know, a big one quite there. And Wi-Fi is reliant on your Wi-Fi router staying alive and staying working for it. If you put a UPS onto that, if you do other things, you can get around those limitations, but it's still something to think about with a lot of these domestic ones. The last one of these that I want to talk about is slightly above that, and that's the Uniden Solo Cams. This has one of the worst product names I think I've ever seen, which is 4G Solo Cam Kit something or other. It's huge and long, but the essential idea is you've got a solar panel, a battery charged from the solar panel, and a camera, and you can put your own SIM card into it. So this thing can be strapped up to a pole on a building site. It could be onto a fuel dump in remote you know, northern Queensland. It doesn't really matter. This thing just goes up there and does the job. It's got an inf uh, a PIR into it, so it'll detect heat mo movement as well as normal movement for a video. Really good way to do this sort of work in one box, one system. Just supply your SIM card and hope you've got enough uh, you know, SIM card, well, you've got enough phone data and enough coverage at site to actually make that make sense. All right, so plenty of options in that sort of space for it. On the other side of it, in the DOS security camera range, we cover everything from analog cameras, AHD cameras, which are a digital version of analog. They're called analog HD, so up to 1080p, 5 megapixel, I think there's some 6 megapixel cameras out in the market around that AHD thing as well. Uh, TVI, CVI, SDI, all other versions of using coax to send digital information for cameras. Our hybrid recorders will cover all of those. So plug in any camera you like to the system you know, that's based on coax and it will work. The thing you've got to keep in mind is you can't mix and match. So I can't have two old analog you know, 720 line analog cameras couple of AHD cameras, a CVI camera that I got at a show, I can't put them all together because the DVR doesn't know how to distinguish one different coax system from another one. So make them all the same and it works really well. Um, for people who are upgrading old systems, typically the way they'll do it is take something like you know, one of our newer AHD cameras, like this. This one, put it into analog mode so it still works on the old analog system, use the existing coax and everything else like that for it and the camera works just fine. There's a little knobby you know, joystick control on here. If you press it to the left for three seconds, I think it turns to composite, so analog mode. Press it to the right for three seconds, it turns into AHD full digital mode. So this can upgrade an old system just with a new camera. And once the old cameras start to fail or something else happens to it, replace all the old ones piece by piece with AHD ones and once you've got rid of all the old analog ones switch them all into AHD mode and now you've got two megapixel 1080p you know beautiful quality images of the cameras that have been working for you all the way through. Uh, all of our analog all of our AHD cameras do that we've got everything from little miniature ones there's a pinhole one that I didn't bring out today as well so if you really want to hide it away and through to this little silver beastie, which is about the cheapest camera that we sell. So if you've got to do simple upgrades on somebody outside or inside for a shop front, this is a pretty good little option too. All right, moving on from the coax based ones a little bit, I want to talk about the hybrid DVR quickly. So the hybrid that we have here is what's called a five in one. So it'll handle all the different types of coax based cameras as well as IP cameras. So with that AHD, uh, with the hybrid recorder, if you switch it into the right mode, I can pull up the IP cameras from my network and use those with it as well. So if you have a mixture of different ones in a system, that works out pretty well. So if I switch across, this should be my hybrid one. Yes, it is. All right, I have defaulted all of these earlier. The only thing I have changed uh, since then is I turned off the alarms that were beeping and making a whole heap of noise, but they are in fully default mode. With this system, if I go into my system settings and device parameter, and right down the bottom there's a thing called video stream mode. There's four options under here, and I probably don't expect you to see them because you're a long way away. The four options are 16 analog, 
1296 by 1944 by 16 preview plus 9 playback. 16 analog, uh, 1296 by 1944 plus 9 digital at 1080p plus 25 preview plus 9 playback. 8 analog at a resolution plus 9 preview plus 8 playback. And 8 analog at 8 digital, 16 channel preview at 8 channel playback. So by default, this thing comes out of the box ready to go for digital coax cameras. And if I'm on this one that's here, I can put up to 16 cameras into the unit, see all of those 16 cameras on screen, and I can play back up to nine of those cameras simultaneously. Can't preview, uh, sorry, can't play back all 16 uh, because there's just not enough bandwidth in the system to allow you to do that and record at the same time. Hard drive limitations and the rest too. The next one down, 16 analog plus nine digital. Now I've got the ability to pull IP cameras in from the network as well. Preview up to 25 on the screen, and I can play back up to eight, uh, sorry, nine again. Down a bit further, eight analog plus nine preview plus eight playback, and then eight analog, eight digital, 16 preview and eight playback. So if I do this and save, it will reboot the device. So we'll come back in and then we'll search for and find the cameras just to show you that it does work and that it does its thing. So when you've got one of these recorders out of the box, it's not ready to go for IP cameras until you make that adjustment. That's the only thing you have to do to make it work. The last thing I'll say about that is, yeah, it's switched across the wrong unit. Um, the only thing I'll say about that is the hybrid recorder only has one ethernet port on the back of it. So if your cameras are PoE based, like almost every camera on the market, you will have to grab a PoE switch of some kind or PoE injectors for your cameras to actually power them up and make them work on your network. And once you do that and configure it properly, then you can find them and do what you need to do. So while this is setting itself up, the hybrid's got 16 inputs on the back of it. They're labeled, they're different resolutions that they support within each different bank. And there's a maximum bandwidth in terms of the maximum amount of resolution and things like that that you can actually record with these things. So if you grab five megapixel cameras and try to put 16 of them in there, it won't work because it can't handle that amount of resolution and traffic all in one go. So be aware when you're buying these ones and how you pick them up, at what resolutions you choose and how it all goes together. Um, the hybrid also has the most number of audio inputs, so manalog, um, uh, manual analog inputs. So if you want to run external microphones in to record voices or for quality assurance and customer coaching purposes and whatever, staff coaching purposes, you can do that. It also has the most amount of triggered uh, alarm inputs and outputs. So if you want to use this thing to trigger a light to go off or a gate to open or something else to happen, the hybrid ones have got the most choice and most options for you on that one. So now you can see we've gone across to this and if I log in, the vault password is for our guys that have done it. What is it? That's it. Double eight, double eight, double eight. Very lucky in Chinese culture, hence the reason why they choose it that way. This guide, I'll go through in a little bit more detail when I go to the NVR rather than this one. We'll skip it for now. And if I go into my channel settings for it, I search from here. I'm connected into my router. My router is connected across to this switch and this switch is powering up all the cameras that are on this board over here. So I should be able to see my cameras come up that are connected. So there's five of them, there's five of those. Notice on this side, we've got channels nine through 16. So my first eight are now my coax cameras. The other nine to 16 are my IP. I can't switch them internally. It doesn't work that way. It always puts the last ones down at the bottom of the screen. When you're on the preview screen, you can adjust them around and do other things like that. We can do from our search here, you can see that there's a camera. I'll add that one into it and save. Yeah, whatever. Go back to here and now I have my IP camera connected and working. So simple as that, it's off it goes. There's a bit of other stuff going on on my little network here at the same time, so it'll be a little bit of choppiness in terms of the vision, but that's where my IP camera goes. If I plugged a coax camera into input one, then my coax camera would come up on input one and so on and so on. So it's pretty simple to work with, pretty simple to operate, and that's the way that this one will work.
So I'm just going to delete that one from here for now. Yeah, for that, but you can see on this one, you've got an option of different types of formats. You can pick up and you know, the S-Link and OnViv cameras, and I'm going to do a little bit more about that in a second as well. Uh, in terms of how the cameras are viewed on screen, you could group it. So if you have IP cameras and coax cameras out the front, group them, say front cameras, group the rest of them, say back cameras, and it doesn't matter what cameras are in which sequence, you can view them as groups then and it makes it a little easier to do. And on our preview screen, you can literally click and drag one screen onto another one. So if I choose say this view, so I've got a main view up here and I click and drag this across, I can exchange the connection, exchange the sequence, or exchange the window. And if I exchange the window, now my channel, whatever it is, three is up here and channel six is down here. So yeah, you can make it look the way that your customers want to in that sense as well. Uh, other things to note with the hybrid systems are that they are pretty similar to the NVRs. If you're used to using one, you'll be used to using the other one. You can see that a lot of the same things are in here. What are different are some of these settings. So in the channel parameters, the display settings, the recording parameters, the snapshot parameters, these are things that don't, aren't quite the same in the NVRs because a coax based camera doesn't necessarily communicate the same way that an IP one does. So in here, my channel names and features and times and dates and so on, they're all fine. My signal detection mode down here, so AHD, uh, CVI or TVI or auto detection mode for it but I can't go into here and set the WDR settings. I can't set backlight correction. I can't do any of those other things that the camera might be able to do. For anything like that, on a camera like this one, I've got to use the little joystick controller on the camera itself to adjust those specific settings that I want to do. So some you'll be able to do in terms of mirroring and basic stuff, but the rest will be done on the camera itself, which probably makes even better an argument for a tool like this one that allows you to plug it straight into the camera, power it up, use the little joystick controller to do everything you want to do, then plug it back into the coax and run down the rest of the system. So very, very useful thing to have. Recording parameters that are here, it tells you what resolution, frame rate and so on that you're actually doing, same as the other. And then you can take snapshots off this one. So something happens, take you know three or four snapshots every three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds. Instead of taking, trying to pull in static images out of a video feed, you actually take full high res, natural snapshots of the action or of what's happening right now. Trust me, with things like a facial, you know, if you're trying to see somebody's face, if you're trying to see a number plate, trying to grab static images out of a moving car as it goes past on screen, you'll get corruption errors and data errors and the rest of it. Snapshots will pull them down in whatever resolution they can pull and try to make it neat and clean for you. Uh, motion is here, um, through here, we've got sensitivity levels. There's no adjustment for area. If I had a TVI or CVI camera, they might be able to communicate and do some more you know, clever adjustment. And there's linkage in here, which I will go through a little bit more on the other ones. But you can see from this that you've got a lot more options in terms of alarm output. You've got options in terms of previews and snapshots and ways the other one does, and you've got PTZ controls for the linkage too. So all good, works really well. Uh, disk manager, this one could take up to four hard drives in its native form. This one will take two. One other error that comes up a lot when you get things beeping is on this screen here. There is a thing called a missing alarm. What that means is if the hard drive's not plugged in, then the alarm will go off. So if you have a two bay unit and you've got the missing alarm on both of these ones, you've only got one hard drive actually plugged into it, then the missing alarm will keep either flashing up the top or beeping at you to say, hey, you know, I'm missing a hard drive. Well, I only put one hard drive in there. I only wanted one hard drive in there. That's not much use at all. So if you're getting beeping noises, chances are it's the missing alarm here or it's one of these ones. So our exceptions or abnormal ones here for hard disk full, no hard drive, network hard drives dropped, smart facility dropped out, network disconnected or an IP conflict. And any of those that are triggering an audible warning will make this thing beep at you in a horrible noise. So easy enough to do. Uh, otherwise, most of this is pretty similar to what the NVRs have got. So I'm gonna jump across to those and show you what they do. 
Uh, all of this is more or less the same, so. All right, cool. Moving across, let's go to the NVRs and we'll give this something to look at. So, what I want you to think about to start off with is a camera and a hard drive and an NVR is a partnership, but each part works without the other part. So, a traditional analog camera is just a camera. You put some sort of vision onto the sensor and it pushes that out the back of it continuously and then the DVR records it, doesn't record it, triggers it, whatever else happens internally. The camera is quite done. As they moved on, they started adding a little bit of processing on the board, so those chipsets that allow for things like those little remote controls, so you could do things like wide dynamic range, you know, mirroring, backlight correction, and so on, were done in the cameras themselves. With an IP camera, it's possible to have 50, 500, 5,000 more features in the camera than there are in the NVR itself. So you can use the camera as a standalone system, you can use the NVR as a standalone system, or you can combine the two together. And this is where the biggest confusion comes when setting these things up and making them work. Is you bought a camera with wide dynamic range, you bought it with a massive PTZ zoom, you've got um, smart motion recording with line triggering and all these other things like that. And then you set it up in the NVR and none of those features are available to you. And you're not seeing the image quality or anything else that you want to do. That's a problem. So what I want to try and show you now is how those things go together and how it could work or not work depending on what you're trying to do. Now this unit was defaulted as well, um, so I haven't set any of these cameras. I haven't asked the, the NVR to look for them, I haven't done anything else. What happens now is that the latest generation of our NVRs have got a little sticker on the top of them and a lot of the camera boxes do as well that says S-Link plug and play or S-Link plug and play enabled. Now S-Link is a proprietary format that the DOS factory has come up with and what it does is if I plug in an S-Link camera to an NVR that also supports S-Link, it will automatically pick up and pull in the video and the image for the camera itself and that's what we've got going on here. I haven't looked for any of these, it's just automatically assigned five of these cameras into it based on what I've already done. Um, it's really that simple. Uh, if you have S-Link cameras and S-Link NVR, that's it. Job's done, right? That's all you need to do, ever? Don't have to touch anything else? Not quite. There's a couple of things that still go wrong from here. One of these is a fisheye camera. And fisheye camera has a really huge benefit in that this is a horrible image. It's skewed and it's off axis and everything else. And it's, you can see it's rounded in the edges. There's no straight lines anywhere you're looking. And a fisheye camera you want to split, you want to have each section handled separately, you want it to be de-warped and so on for it. The automatic setups put it on there but it hasn't done the rest of those things that we really want it to do. Uh, if I now go, let's just do this, log out, we'll do it as if I'm doing it brand new. So when I'm not logged into the DVR, I can zoom in and out on my screens, I can't adjust which one goes where, I can adjust how many I'm viewing but not a hell of a lot else. I can't play with the sequences over here. I might be able to, nope, can't do it. So I'm locked out of a lot of things, but this is how most people on a daily basis will use it. None of my menu options are here. Go into my start, go into my login, and the password again is double eight, double eight, double eight. Did I do too many? No, I got that right. First time you set this thing up, you'll come up with a guide like this one. This, for Windows users, is your smart wizard. This is how you start. It will ask you what language you prefer to speak. And if you speak any of the other languages that are on here, fantastic, please choose those. That might make it more understandable or less, depending on how well the factory is translated from uh, Chinese to those other languages. This one's capable of up to 4K at 30 hertz. So you can run this into a 4K screen without any trouble. If you're running VGA from the output of this, the only option you have is 1280 by 1024. So if you're plugging this into an old, low-resolution VGA monitor from 25 years ago, chances are that might not work and you need to buy another $100 monitor. Uh, we've got some great deals on Dawa 22-inch ones with HDMI at the moment, and they'll look a lot better than the $100 ones. In this setting, we go to this next page, and this is where it starts to get one step more complicated, and I'm not going to go into the LAN 2 stuff just yet, but... 
I've got essentially two network cards in here. One is to communicate with the rest of my network and one is to communicate with the PoE switch and the cameras plugged straight into the device itself. Okay, LAN 1 for the main network, LAN 2 internal stuff. LAN 1, I have manually assigned an IP address here for it. I'm going to change that. I'm going to put it onto 210. My gateway is that, and I know that because I already know what my IP address of my modem router is. If you walk onto a site and you don't know what the IP address of your system is, you can use DHCP to find it. Plug it into the network, use DHCP, automatically assigns an IP address, and off you go. Now, have any of you done that before and it's caused issues or had phone support calls from people that have done this and it's caused a problem? It's pretty common. What happens with DHCP is fine for right now, but if my power goes out to my modem router and my NVR and everything else that's in my system, what happens when that comes back up again and every device starts to talk to that modem again and they all ask for IP addresses? If my phone now connects faster than the NVR does to get back online, my phone might take the old IP address that this was sitting on. That's fine, the NVR might jump to another IP address. But what about the camera that was trying to grab an IP address that was where your, cam where your you know, mobile phone or your tablet or your laptop or your smart TV or your smart fridge or whatever else has now got it? I tend to recommend people assign manual IP addresses for everything. That's the NVRs and every single camera that's connected to the system as well. It's good practice and you can set it wherever you want to and make sure that there's no chance of them causing problems later on. So for this, I've chosen an IP address for my NVR. I know my gateway is there. On this screen, I've got my apps to view. So a bit of confusion happens here where it says Apple and Android. People think if you're on an Apple phone, scan that one and it'll be the code for the device. That's not right. That takes you to the iOS app store for this app. So scan that with a camera on your phone, go to the app store, install the app, then scan this. This one here is the ID for this particular device. It's on the top of the unit as well. There's a code that's stuck onto the thing. And there's also, a, I think it's a 14 digit uh, alphanumerical code on there. That QR code, that alphanumeric code are equivalent. So if you set up a system for somebody here in Australia and their partner happens to be in the US, you can send the app details, username and password, and that 12, 14 digit code across to them. All they have to do is put that code in, put the username and password, and then they can view it live from wherever they are in the world, if it's set up correctly. So don't try and scan that or send that across to them. It's easier just to do the, the code off the top of the unit. Um, I would finish here, except it says don't display next time. If you're doing this once, you don't ever have to see that guide again unless you manually want to. It's up in the menus from here. The next step I would typically do is go to my system setting and go to my network settings page. So from my network settings page here, I've got the options to set parts. So in LAN 1, 1.210 and 1.1, that's all fine. DNSs are okay. My default route down the bottom is LAN 1 because that's what's connected to my network. If I go across to LAN 2, what you'll notice is I've got a static IP address and it's automatically set to 192.168.2.189. That comes out of the box by default. That's exactly what it is. That may not work with your network. You may already have another subnet that's using those particular details. And I'm talking about subnets and IP addresses and DHCP and the rest. In two weeks time on Valentine's Day, I'm going to do a training course on love your network, appropriately enough. I may even have love heart shaped cookies or chocolates and things for people who want to attend. But the idea is to go through a lot more about networks and how they go together. For today, I'll talk about subnets and IPs. I'm hoping you're following along with me. If not, come back in a couple of weeks and it'll make a lot more sense. From this though, I've got a different subnet for my internal ones, a different gateway from here, and that's all fine. It means that any camera that's connected directly to it needs to be in that subnet range, 192.168.2. something. And I'll show you how that works in a second when I connect to the rest of the network. Uh, let's have a look. There's a whole heap of other stuff in here, but things you might want to look at. Management platform that's here. This is where the FSEYE comes up. It's obviously ticked by default. You can bring up the QR codes here again. There's the serial number for the unit, as we've seen. 
And this bit at the end here says register successfully. In other words, it's already talked through my modem, it's connected to the outside world, it's registered it with the servers in Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever they are, and it's already online and ready to go. If I look in my, uh, my, where is it on this one? In my advanced settings, there's a thing called enable UPnP, and all of these ports that are here are the ones that talk to the outside world to enable it to do this sort of thing. And if I pull it up on my phone now that I've set up earlier, I can see the cameras on this unit already. It's connecting and talking to the outside world. Uh, this needs to be refreshed, but basically all of these should be effective and they're seeing what they're supposed to do. Uh, last thing in this side is the user management, where you can set passwords and permission levels and things like that for people. If you change the admin password and forget it, then the unit's got to come back to us. There's no on-site recovery. There's no other way of getting that working for you. So if this is out in the back of Queensland or you know Western WA up north, the unit's got to come back to us here in Melbourne for our technicians to do the work here to actually replace it uh, and change it back to the default. So be very careful when you install one of these things. What a lot of installers will do is set up a secondary account and use this as, say, an everyday account. Give them permissions to do most of the things except mess with the admin password. So they can play back, they can record, they can adjust the camera settings and a lot of the other things like that, but they can't adjust the admin one. And then they keep a record of the admin password in a secure password manager, in a piece of paper at the back of the filing cabinet, on the underside of the fridge, wherever it is, so long as you know where that password is, it's safe and secure and off you go. It's a very, very good idea is to not give people access to the full admin account for it. Um, admin account means you can break anything. An everyday one or a user account means you hopefully won't be able to break absolutely everything. Um, my device settings that are here, we've seen before, but there's one little one down the bottom that I want to show you. This is IPC protocol. So this is IP camera protocols that this unit can see and work with. You can see the S-Link, we've got plug and play enabled. There's also an option to enable uh, plug and play for i8 cameras as well. So if you have some of our older DOS cameras that only talk i8 and OnVIF, then you can also still do this automatic setup IP address thing just by ticking that little box to make it work. You'll see that it will pull in OnVIF cameras, it'll pull in RTSP video streams and other stuff like that as well if you want it to. And you can find all of those through, that, through the channel settings page, which coincidentally is where we're off, up to next. So let's do a search through my network here. And while it's doing that, I'm going to connect up another camera. And right, so when I've done my search here, I've searched for three different protocols, i8, onvif, and s-link. So older cameras, newer cameras, they should all be able to be found. If I redo this search now that I've plugged in the Hikvision camera, we'll see if it comes up on my list as an onvif one as well. It can take a little while to reset. Yeah, not quite yet. This one again. What this table will show you is the IP addresses for each of the cameras, the protocol that they're talking in, uh, the type of connection that it is, device information, as well as which network card they're connected to. So with the, uh, the five that are up the top of the link, we've got S-Link enabled. So all of these ones have automatically set themselves up in the system for it. The OnVIF ones that are down here, if you look carefully at them, most of them are with the same S-Link cameras. So 53 has S-Link and i8 and OnVIF. 54 has OnLink and, uh, OnVIF and S-Link. S-Link for 190 and OnVIF for 190 and so on and so on. So if we've pulled the S-Link ones for each of these, we've covered all of the cameras that we have, which is great. And it says network card LAN 1. So, that means they're not connected directly to this NVR itself. It's connected to my modem router. The modem router is connected to the big blue LAN cable that comes across and is going up into my switch here. 
and my switch here is now connected to the camera. So the five cameras that we're seeing are all over on this board here, connected to this PoE switch, that PoE switch into the network, hence LAN 1. If I connect a camera directly into the unit, so let's take the little mini one that's here, and we'll wait for about 30 seconds while we do it. When I do this search for it, this one will appear differently to the other ones. And I'll need to set it up differently if I want it to be visible. Okay, so I've got some lights on, so this might be soon enough. Let's see how we go. Not too quick, I think. Now, the big benefit of having most of your cameras onto the rest of the network is I can have my PoE switch here, single cable link, put this away in a cupboard somewhere and off it goes. The drawback of doing that is I'm relying on this switch to pass all the traffic and there'll be a lot of traffic. There's a lot of packet collisions, a lot of video traffic that's getting hung up in here. So smart switches and other things like that are really useful when that stuff comes across because then you can do a lot more with it in terms of uh, having one port that's my communications port backwards and forwards and all other cameras don't talk to each other, they only talk with the NVR or the rest of my network. And you can see right down the bottom of my list I've got one here that's come up on LAN 2, which is what I wanted. So this one at the moment is 192.168.1.191. If I double click on it, I don't see any vision. It's not working. But it's plugged straight in, why isn't it working? Well. It's because of that LAN 2 side of things. Remember what we said before? If I want anything to appear from my LAN 2, I have to give it an IP address that matches that network. So let's do .2.191, change my gateway here to be uh, .2.1. By the way, I'm using a wireless mouse. I get people asking all the time if you can do that, you can. Um, the least, less complicated the wireless mouse is, the better. So simple Logitech like this one works really well. If I modify this information now, what should happen is my camera accepts that stuff. If I refresh it, if I get things right, now my camera is running and it's online. If I bring it across here now, you can see it's on my camera list as .2.191, connect success, it's channel six, isn't it? which is that one. Yeah, there we go. So my little dome camera is now talking and doing what it's supposed to do. And that's just by changing the IP address across. This is one of the most fundamental things that people get wrong. They set up LAN 1 correctly for the rest of the network and they plug all the cameras in and wonder why they're not actually talking and doing their thing properly. With S-Link enabled, I can plug all of those cameras into that LAN 2 port and they should all set themselves up and get the right IP addresses and so on and be ready to go. But if they're not, then you going in and doing what I've just done to manually change that IP address is the simplest way of making that happen. And you can also do that via desktop tools on your computer. And if I log in remotely to your system to help out or if something else happens that way, that's what I'll do, is I'll use a desktop tool uh, to actually uh, understand what's going on, find the cameras, find the NVRs, and make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. So I'll switch across to that for a second, just so I show you what that looks like. Now, on my network at the moment, my laptop's connected via Wi-Fi to the modem router. So I've got an IP address of 192.168.1. something. Up the top, I can see I'm connected wirelessly. I can do a search for a whole heap of different types of cameras, NVRs, DVRs, and so on. I do my search here and bang, up comes my list of things. Takes a few seconds to go through the whole scale. And there we are. So I've got a whole heap of cameras on my network. So 53, 54, I've got two NVRs sitting at 189. I've got 190, 192, 200 and 210. I cannot see that camera that I've just added. That camera, is only connected to that NVR, it's only connected to that LAN 2 port. It's not gonna jump across that boundary between internal card and external ones. Anything you do within those cards has to be done on the NVR itself. Um, in which case, if I uh, 
I can't remember what IP address I set for this one now, but from this page, I can adjust any of these other IP addresses that I choose. Double click on here, and I'm talking directly to the camera and I can adjust it to be what I want it to be. It's an easy way of seeing where the cameras are on the network if you can't find them through the DVR or if there's something going on. From here, it also gives me a list that means I can go to their individual IP addresses and do any other settings that I might want to do. So bring up the camera itself. It'll ask me to set the admin password for it. I'm gonna save it as nothing because I think this will give me that same error again, yeah. So let's just call it password 01. Log into it. Okay, I don't want to save any of these things. We'll do this for now. And it's going to block it. Um, Flash is a lot of fun at the moment, thanks to uh, Chrome and a lot of other browsers blocking it or not letting it work. From here though, I've got all the individual settings for my camera and I can go through and adjust these as I go. And if I want to adjust how it looks, if I want to adjust my encoding ability or anything else, logging into the camera gives me full control over that camera. Any feature that the camera has that the MVR doesn't is available through this menu. So if you're seeing an image that you're not expecting or something that you don't like the look of, doing it through here works really, really well. Now, going back across, obviously that allows me to set in all the cameras, making sure all the IP addresses are correct. From this page, I can also go across into my modem. And from here, my little TP link one that I'm using, go into my advanced page, go into my, I think it's security. And, nope. I'm wrong, network on this one. Go into my LAN settings page from here and I can manually assign IP addresses in this network to devices. So from here, I can make sure that nothing ever takes that IP address again. You know, so when it comes back up online, my phone will never connect to 192.168.1.200 because now I've assigned this specifically to be available for my NVR when it connects back up to it. One of the most common things that goes wrong is when people power up, power down, change things around, it won't talk anymore, and the MAC address is the main one, and the IP address is the main thing that goes wrong there. All right, all right, to have a little quick break while I'm talking about other things, my favorite thing about cameras is the unexpected. <laughs> um, the idea about an IP camera is you're, you're trying to catch the expected problems as well as the unexpected ones. So, in the middle of the night, down my suburban driveway in Reservoir, there's Skippy. Um, that laneway that's alongside us there, where, he, where he's going, dead ends. There's no way through it, there's no way out of it, and yet I haven't seen him come out on those cameras yet. So I don't know what happened to him, but he's uh, still stuck down there to this day. And I really love watching the silly friends pour water all over themselves. It's just, I could watch that on repeat for hours and hours and hours. Okay, bit of a light break while we're doing other things. All right, back over to the NVRs for now. Switch. So most of the problems that we have with these systems are IP related. People not setting the IP address of the cameras correctly, not setting the IP address of the NVR correctly, not looking at LAN 2 versus LAN 1 and making sure the cameras match with that when they do it. The other one is older cameras with new NVRs or uh, new cameras with old NVRs. So the cameras themselves talk in particular formats. They have the Onvif, S-Link, i8, Hikvision has their own formats, Daha has their own formats, on uh, Uniview, etc. They all have their own formats to make this stuff work. If you have an older DOS camera, it might like i8 and Onvif will be the only options that it has. If you've got a newer one, it might be S-Link and 
uh, S-Link and OnViv are the only two options that it sees. Your old NVR might not cover S-Link and OnViv gives you such limited control over the cameras that you probably don't want to use that if you, you know, can avoid it. So what do I do if I've got an, a new camera or an old camera, an old NVR, a new NVR and I want to make them talk together better? So on my computer, go back across to here, go to my camera tools and I'm going to jump into, I think it's 190 should do it, 192 to 168.190. Mm. Let's try English. Yeah, I don't really care about it. Uh, that's not going to let me do it. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's try 192 instead. That's better. Go into my setup for this one and I'm going to go all the way down to uh, management platform. So this is going to be hard to see, but these are the three formats that this camera can use to talk. FSEYE GB28181 and I8S is in this camera. It's a brand new camera, but it has I8S in there. If I modify this and turn this to on, so what was this, 192 I think we were looking at? Jump back across to my NVR now. So management platform, remember that bit. Go into my search now, I'm gonna turn off OnVIF and S-Link. I'm going to do that search again. It might take a minute to take hold or I might have to reboot it depending on the camera. But i8 is now visible and so I can search for and find an old i8 camera through there. Uh, I might actually need to set the password. Or I might need to reboot the power to it. Um, the idea is i8 will come up on my list here and then I'll be able to select it and use it. So a camera that's brand new on an old NVR, tick and select and enable that option and off it goes. It's not enabled out of the factory because S-Link is better. It does more things, can talk to more devices and can make it all work properly. But... Of those three protocols hmm. you mentioned before, one was S-something and wasn't S-Link. No, there was FSEYE, which is the... Uh, the remote access one. So you can directly access a camera even if you don't have an NVR. Enable FSEYE, there's a QR code and scan and all the rest of it from there as well. Uh, GB2181 uh, is another type of streaming protocol as well that we typically don't use. But they're on some DVRs, so I think possibly Dawa's or Higvision's one of those ones, you might prefer to use that over the uh, OnVIF ones instead. But which, you've got a, of your protocols, mm -hmm. you were talking about S-Link before is the best one to use. Yeah, so, so S which one is the S-Link's not on this list because you can't turn it off. It's its default way of talking and it's always going to do S-Link, no matter everything else. The I8S though is one that we're, we can add. FSEYE we can turn off if we don't want people to go through and do it. If we... Uh, I don't think this is going to give me, through developer tools you can, but we're not actually doing that here. And streams, no, it's not going to give me what I want. Yeah, no, S-Link enabled by default, so there's nothing I can do to change that one. Whereas with the, the other ones, I can still enable that. So a new camera, you can, uh, you can get it to work on an older system. Uh, the alternate way around is trying to use an OnVIF camera with the newer systems. So switch back and across. And inst let's have a look. Actually, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Search in here. All right, so we've got a whole heap of OnVIF cameras potentially here. They're ones that we already know about. They're ones that we're already using. But if I want to connect an OnViv camera, there's another step that goes on. 
S-Link and i8 and so on communicate between DOS cameras, DOS NVRs. They automatically set their passwords, they talk to each other properly, everything works really well. With OnVIF, OnVIF is a generalized standard that you have to follow specific rules to be able to talk to certain things. So in this case, if I want to add this as an OnVIF camera, I can't see the camera on screen here. It's not showing up for me. If I change my uh, change my default gateway here to match what it should be, 192, doesn't work. I can't modify it, can't change anything. Nothing's happening here because my username and password are blank. And in fact, for this particular camera, I haven't set one. I haven't given it a username and password yet, unless that was the one that I did before. Go to 200. So, if I bring up my camera page on my computer, I try to log into it and it will say, do you need to modify your password? If you're going to use I, uh, OnVIF, you absolutely have to do that. So, if I do this, Password 01, password 01, save. Doesn't matter. Flash. Make sure it worked. Great, I'm in, I'm working. Don't care about that. So now, I switch back across to my NVR. In my NVR, I have my OnVIF camera number 200. I'm just going to remove the old one from here just in case that causes me any grief. My 200 camera here, I double click into it. I can do admin here. I can put my, should have chosen a short to password because it's irritating to do this with a mouse, but anyway, do that. Modify, okay, success. Refresh my camera for it, and now I'm viewing it. So if you're adding an OnVIF camera to a system, you need to have a username and password for it. Some by default have a username and password, others do not. So keep that in mind when you're doing it and when you're using this stuff as well. On to OnVIF, I wanna talk about Hikvision. So Hikvision is a very popular brand. Um, we sell them, we sell a whole heap of other ones as well. Each different brand does things slightly differently. So if I plug my Hikvision camera into my PoE switch and wait for a minute, it'll be plugged into my network and it should be able to talk to everything else that's on there if I've actually, no it won't because I haven't got an extra cable plugged in. Hang on a second. Now Hikvision likes Hikvision cameras to talk to Hikvision NVRs, not surprisingly, because they sell both of them. If you want to use a Hikvision NVR with something else, however, that will cause you some dramas. So that one, let's go to, to my hybrid, I don't care about, let's plug that into there. So I've now got my PoE switch into my modem, PoE switch into the Hikvision, and the Hikvision should be talking through the network to everything else that's there seems to be and it's powering up which is nice so if i go and do my search now in theory i do yeah there it is there is my hikvision camera on my list and i can add it with onviv put a username and password in that i've already set for it and make it work simple enough hikvision camera i can now view on my dos nvr and i go to here, tick this one for that. It's going to connect failed because the password is wrong. Go to this down here, change this to admin. Okay, save that exit. From there should. Uh, what have I done? Do that again. 
Now, there's one thing that I have done off camera before training that makes all of this potentially possible, which is I've actually already set up this Hikvision camera because I had to. And I'll t that makes more sense if I go back across the computer again, unfortunately. Am I getting across to you that you probably need a computer when you go out to t install a CCTV system these days? You definitely will. Hikvision, by default, doesn't want their cameras to talk to anybody else's systems. They just want them to talk to their own. So if I run this little tool called Batch Configuration, which is a Hikvision one, or the SADP tool, either one, this comes up on the screen here. And down the bottom, you will see there is my little camera. You can see that it's been activated already, straight out of the box. These things are deactivated. In other words, unless you plug them into a Hikvision NVR, they don't talk. And even when you do, you have to set passwords through the NVR that propagate to the cameras to make them work. Does that make sense? It's a security feature on their side to make these things work properly. However, one other thing is wrong when it's done this way. If I go into here and do my one touch configure, I'll use the same password I did before, because apparently it doesn't really care much about that. So my network parameters, I might want to adjust and do what I want to do from there. But this is the big one right here. Go to my OnVIF configuration and by default, these cameras have OnVIF disabled. Out of the box, it's not working. The only format they have is Hikvision's format. If you want to get one of them working with our NVR, you have to enable OnVIF, give it a username and password, then go back into your NVR, put those usernames and passwords in, use OnVIF, and then you can talk and use it and view it the same way that we did before. But remember, you have to use Hikvision's tool or UniView's tool or Dahua's tool or anybody else's. Go in make sure the IP addresses are right, make sure OnVIF is enabled, that there's a username and password for it, and then you'll be able to view the cameras and use them with our systems. So if you're on a site, you've got existing cameras, you want to upgrade the NBR, it's definitely possible to do. The other way to register or activate one of these cameras is using a CCTV tool like this one. So this is our T700P4K, the latest one. What this has built into it is a Hikvision app. It has an Access app, it has a Dawa one, it has a UniView app and so on for it. With this system, if I plug in now my blue and I will get this connected to HDMI that I was playing with before, this one, you should be able to see what I'm seeing. And what that one's three, I think, isn't it? Beautiful, it is. So this is my CCTV tool. You're seeing what I'm seeing, so I'm not gonna keep holding this up because I won't be able to see what I need to see. Tool itself has the option to provide PoE power or not provide PoE power. You can see how it's wired, which configurations it's running through and everything else. If I go to my IPC test Pro thing, or I can go down to my HIC app. If I go into my HIC app, you can see that I've already had this one in there before. With this particular camera, I've got my password set over this side. It's the model of the camera there, you know, my settings for IP address and the rest of it. I can modify my passwords and video settings and so on. All the rest of the things that you can do with this particular camera, you can do through this test tool to make sure it works properly. You know, bit rates and everything else that's there, your yeah, whole heap of different information about how it all works. And I can also obviously view that camera on screen. Easy enough to do. Factory reset it and so on and so on. Great. If I'm on a joint site where I've got multiple different cameras, I can go into my standard test here. I can select from this and I've got a range of different types of cameras that I can test and use, including stuff that only has a web browser. So if it's not covered by any of our apps, say it's a, I don't know, insert brand name you know, X here, I can go to its IP address via Chrome, log into that and then still use this tool to configure it and do everything else that I want to do through there. 
This will handle up to 4K cameras or 8 megapixel cameras without any drama at all. I mean, that is a 4K camera that's connected to it now. Um, obviously, you've got data on your network uh, on the side here as well. And there are little shortcuts here to different brands, Dawa, Hick, Uniview, and so on, web browser, network tools, and so on, and so on. From this, tap on my camera. Wait for it to come up. So this is only connected to the camera. So this is providing power to it. It's providing vision, login, and everything else that I might want to do through the unit itself. But it's doing a, doing a test at the moment. It normally doesn't take that long. Probably because I was messing with it before. That's what's going on. From here, I can show my passwords and everything else like that for it as well. But this is sort of the best IP uh, you know, search tool, camera tool, and everything else like that we can possibly do. You've got AHD, uh, CVI, TVI all through this as well. So any kind of camera that you come across, you can use it. It's got 12 volts up to three amps output off this as well. So you can plug it straight into your camera while you're up on the scissor lift or up on the ladder and make it work. You've got a torch on the top of this thing. So you can take it in the roof and make that work as well if you wish. And so on and so on. From this screen, you've obviously got the options for your analog types of cameras. Cable tester modes for coax as well as for data cable. You've got a media player, so if you've got files from here or if you're trying to test the output of an NVR, you can put that onto the HDMI in and now I can view my NVR screen on here, use my mouse and keyboard, you know, use this as my screen for my NVR. I can do an audio recorder, so if I want to you know, pull down information while I'm on site and so on and so on for it. There's a lot of other bits and pieces you can do with these. Through the tools, you've got the ability to supply different types of power. If there's a 12 volt load onto it, a Wi-Fi analyzer and so on and so on. Even a quick office on here. So if you want to write some notes up for an invoice or for something else, you can do that too. And flashlight, because you know, everybody loves a flashlight. Gives you a lovely display on screen and one tiny little LED at the top. And look, the little toggle actually turns it on and off. It's really exciting. And yes, you can, set it for different times and all sorts of other things if that's really what you want to do. But yeah, flashlights are cool. Um, last couple of things, my apps. So from here, some of you will know VLC as a media player for computers. Anybody know what IVMS 4500 is or seen it before? Some of the CCTV guys might have. That's Hikvision's app. So if you've got Hikvision gear or Nest gear or any other one that does an OEM for Hikvision, uh, that Hikvision OEMs for, you can use that app and view it as if you were on a, a phone or I am in this case Android tablet because that's basically what it is. I've disabled it for here because we're not using it, but you could use this to do a Hikvision system pretty easily. Easy view for uh, UniView stuff, DMSS HD Lite, that's the Dawa one. And we added the access tool uh, and the Tiandi tool last time for here. So with Access Tool, this was a request from a particular customer. They had a site that had a lot of Access cameras onto it and they wanted to use our test gear. The factory talked to Access, got the app written, put it together and just dumped it into, the, into here. So now if you have Access cameras, Hikvision cameras, Dawa, our stuff, anything else, you can view them, activate them, do everything else you want to do from here, pretty simply. So it's an $849 retail tool obviously trade discount beyond that one for it, but as an all-in-one test tool for site, I think it's a pretty invaluable thing to have. Now, this one, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which one it is. Uh, we've been buying test tools from these guys for a long time though. Um, there are a lot of tools that look very similar out on the market to this one too. Um, It's no, separate. it's a separate factory or a separate okay. that specialise in like this. Like Some that. that that general idea, yeah. Um, the other thing to keep in mind when you're looking at test tools like these ones is there are a lot of them on the market that look very very similar. So they have the rubber bumpers. They might have the same button layouts and the rest on the sides for it. Beyond that, it actually comes down to what features, options, screen resolution, and everything else like that that's been chosen for them. 
Um, I've seen ones on the market that look like that one, look identical from the outside, but the resolution on the monitor is 240 lines, not you know uh, 800 lines or whatever it is on this. And it's, uh, you know, PoE doesn't work, it doesn't take a 12 volt input or output, and it costs $150 here in Australia. So there are a lot of variations on that if that's the way you want to do it as well. So be very careful what you buy, make sure you can test it if you can. Uh, what did I unplug there before? That was, oh yes, that was my connection to that. All right, so I kind of covered some of the stuff I wanted to from there. The last things I can do via the NVR again. We're going to go back into the recording settings for a minute and we'll do the last little bit here. So each individual camera that we have has multiple options in terms of what they can and can't do. So for example, this particular camera in its lens parameters, we've got the ability to set a whole heap of different things to improve the quality of the image. Say WDR, for example, change that, save that. And then what will happen is you can see there's more detail and more lining in the background where the wide dynamic range comes in from the bright of the light to the darkness that's there. Great, fine, easy to do. If I change anything here like my channel information, and I call this the IP80, for example, which it isn't. Change that one for it. Now it's IP80 on the screen, up in the corner, simple enough. If that's in an obscure spot and I want to put it up in the middle for the channel information, I'll put that down there. I can do that too. And just click and drag and move them around, change my timing, my date format, and everything else like that. Because this is an S Link camera talking to an S Link NVR, all of that works. With OnVIF, that may not happen. Depends on how your OnVIF, OnVIF is enabled. You may have to log into the camera to set those features to do it. For my video encoding settings for this one, I have the option of my mainstream or substream. I can do video or audio. I'm doing 1080p on this particular one at the moment. I can set my bit rates. The lower the bit rate, the lower the image quality, the lower the amount of hard drive space it takes. I can change my encoding type to one of the others from H.264 to 265 to 265 plus. Each of those ones changes the way the video format looks and the resulting sort of movement and smoothness that you have. But H.264 of these three takes up the most hard drive space. 265 takes up a lot less hard drive space and 265 plus takes up even less space than that. Uh, your, I would test these things out nighttime and daytime to see what sort of results you get from it because sometimes you will not want to go to H.265. It'll make your, your video look really crappy. Um, if I go to capture, for example, capture is a static capture, so I can set my, um, take static images, my motion detection settings from here, enable it, change my sensitivity to high, change my arming schedule for every day of the week, copy to that to there, put it across the full screen, but I don't want to cover that little section up in the corner because that could go off all the time. So I right click and drag over that, so that section is no longer motion. Save that one, and now I've set up motion detection on this camera. There is a problem with that though, in that I'm still doing timer recording or alarm recording. So I'm still doing 24 hour day recording and motion at the same time. So what will happen on my playback is I'll do full days worth of recording with all these little spikes where motion events came off. That's really useful for pubs and clubs and so on where they need to have continuous recording but the motion allows you to dial into when something actually happened. You've still recorded everything, but you've got little spikes to tell you what happened with it. Uh, if I went across just straight to alarm recording for channel one and saved that one, now there's only motion recording on this camera. So of all the other ones, they're all green. For this one here, when there's significant motion on it, when it resets, then the, it will only record in motion for that camera. So when you've got both uh, continuous and mm -hmm. um, motion, yep. does it give you like a list of bookmarks or something? Uh, that you More can or less, so yeah. So you can jump from event to event? So if I go to my playback and I tick channel one here, down on the bottom corner you can see normal, motion, alarm, A&R and smart. If I choose motion that's here, so here's my normal recording 
and obviously I had periods where I was turning on and off and doing other things this morning, so the recording stopped. There's a solid bank of recording all the way through from here, and then you'll see right at the end, this is where I had motion and normal recording active, and I've turned off normal recording, and there's my motion triggered recording that's going off there, my motion triggered recording that's going off there, and normal recording as well. If I had uh, stopped this playback, if I had smart recording set on here, say my line crossing alarm, and I do that same thing, then I'd end up with a purple line on the screen wherever the smart event happened. So that could be you know, a line crossing event. If I go back into my channel settings, my channel, no, smart. Go to my line crossing that's here, enable it. <coughs> I'm gonna put a line, say, here and right click get rid of it and I've got A and B listed here. I'm going to do this. So what this means is I've got one detection line on this part of the screen. I can have up to four. I've got an A to B or B to A alarm. So in other words, motion going in and out of that area will trigger it to happen. I've got a proportion. This is the size of the thing that has to be bigger than. So there's a little yellow screen, the yellow box in the middle. I saved that one for it. Now I've got a smart uh, motion alert on this one so that when somebody moves or something moves from one side to the other of this line it'll ping a smart recording on the, uh, the hard drive. The other things I can do with that is I can now link this to do a whole heap of other things. So if I've set this carefully and I've got a limited site, say a, a storage facility where I've got one of these set on the main gate and I've got my line crossing on that main gate. When that line crossing goes off, I could email myself every time that happens to say, somebody's gone through my gate, somebody's gone through my gate. And if I've set this properly and set the proportion right and everything else like that, I'll get this list of alerts that works out that way. I could make it beep every time that happens. I strongly suggest you don't like, don't do that unless you're into masochism or something and torturing yourself. An alarm output can be quite useful. If I set that onto a buzzer, let's say, I've now set this thing up as like a door buzzer. Somebody walks through the door, somebody drives through the gate, off the 12 volt trigger or the contact closure off this onto a 12 volt circuit to a piezo buzzer out the back of my workshop. Now I can hear that something's actually happened or I've triggered a siren or something else or a light to flash. Um, we've got people that have set these things up for people in deaf homes and they use it as like a doorbell alert and a light flashes up on the wall to say that somebody's walked up towards their front door. They might not be able to see the, the buzzer or they might not be able to hear the buzzer, but they can see the big light up on the wall that makes it work. From here, I've got the options to also set recording. I could trigger multiple recordings from this. So if I have, uh, let's say one at the front of the store, one on the hallway in the middle of the store and one at the back door, if the back door is triggered, I might want to start the recording in the middle of the store too, so that when they break in through that back door, the middle one's already recording and seeing exactly what's happened as they start to move into the area for the next camera. So you can have multiple cameras recording from one trigger. PTZ linkage is my favorite one for this though. So if I set this thing up, say in our car park out here, have a big PTZ camera up in the middle there, that's continuously roaming around, just having a look at what's going on, or it has a nice big wide action view of the entire car park. I have line crossing set up on a camera that's on one of the driveways. Now when that line crossing event happens, my PTZ camera goes, gets a trigger that says, go to position one. And so it stops whatever it's doing, it zooms in to position one, which is that driveway, and it looks in close, looks for the license plate, the face, the front of the truck, whatever's going on, and there it is, that's triggered. I can do that anytime I want to, just with PTZ cameras and the linkages that are built into this thing. Very clever, very clean, very easy. Um, there are other versions of this in different areas, so I can do a target count for a store, people coming in and out, forklifts, that sort of thing. Providing my camera supports it, I can make it happen. Um, but if you have a look through my list, that is not a smart camera, so it doesn't have any of those features built into it. It's not in the NVR, it's in the camera itself. And the NVR is just asking the camera to do its job. All right, I've gone over time, so I'm going to stop it from he for here for now. I will try and go through more detail in another time in another place with you know, a lot of these other little features and things that go into it. But the takeaways for me for you are, number one, 
take a laptop with you on site or at a very minimum a test tool like this one and I strongly recommend those. They came back into stock this morning. Technically that's not even in our system yet. It's still sitting from the container to inside here somewhere. So very, very useful tool. Can do a whole heap of things for you. If not, have a laptop with you. Knowing what you're doing with IP addresses is a really important thing with all of these ones. Getting them running on the apps is as simple as FSEYE running, UPnP enabled, scan it, code, done, sorted all the time. Um, and the last thing is remember that the cameras can be smarter than the NVR or they may have features that the NVR doesn't know how to take advantage of. So logging into the camera's pages directly to see what they are capable of and tweaking them to match what you want them to do is the mark of a good installer. It's how you take it from a 95% job to a 100% job or not working to working in some cases as well. All right, I think that'll do it for a general thing. If you want more questions and other stuff like that, come up and ask me afterwards. And uh, yeah, I'll add all your questions to my list for extra training sessions and manuals online and the rest of it. I will give one quick plug, which is our YouTube page has all our videos so you can view this one later and the next one when it comes up. But we also have a support page, which has got a whole heap of different things on a range of different products, including a pretty wide range on the NVRs and DVRs themselves. So from this, for example, how do I reset the admin password for it? It'll tell you exactly how to do it. It'll tell you about an everyday login and all that sort of stuff as well. So if there's an article that's missing or if there's a feature that you want us to put up there, just let me know, just let us know and we'll get it thrown up there so that everybody can benefit from it or we can act as your memory for the next time as well. Okay, thank you very much for your patience and I hope that was interesting for you. Take care. Thank you.